Hi, welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary, to our lectionary podcast. We are uh, today at Proper 18, and we're going to look here at uh, the epistle of, of James. Uh, the story is a real favorite of mine, and um, the theme of partiality, of course, is as relevant today as it ever has been. And here we're reminded that we are created um, in the image of God, every single one of us. None of us is more important than another, and money does not make a man. So we, uh, in the congregation, in our churches, are to act accordingly, according to the way that our Lord would look at things. And uh, so he begins. Now, we wonder whether James is speaking here to brother ministers or to Christians, but he says, Adelphoi mu, my brothers, um, do not in, now this is like the look, looking up the face, do not in partiality um, hold uh, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So um, God is not a respecter of persons. We see this throughout Jesus' ministry. In fact, if he does show partiality, he shows it to the poor. Blessed are the poor. And um, Jesus has quite a bit of this kind of teaching in the Gospel of Luke. When you hold a dinner party, do not invite um, your rich friends or those who can pay you back, but invite the lame, the blind, the crippled, those who cannot repay you. Um, and this all com also comes out in the preaching of Peter that our Lord is not a lord of partiality, whether it's Jew or Gentile, rich or poor, as it is in this case. So don't hold in partiality the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory. Um, so, for instance, and you have a story. Um, this is so interesting. So if uh, there comes into uh, your synagogue, so this is an early time period in which um, that seems the epistle of James was very early, and you have uh, a Jewish Christianity here. You can imagine a Jewish synagogue uh, where the people heard the word of the Lord, heard the word of Christ, and, and believed it. Um, so these are Jewish Christians who are in the gathering. Then a man comes into you, and he's got uh, crucodactulus. He's got gold rings, and he's in his fine clothing. And now, I suppose, in our sermons, we could imagine... I'm not a big uh, clothes person myself, as you can tell. I don't have the designer clothes, but um, we know, I'm, I, I know when somebody comes in and they are dressed well, that's a sign, that the sign of wealth. And of course, people gravitate towards, towards the wealthy. So somebody comes in with the gold ring and the fine clothes. And then there also comes in a patokos, uh, uh, a poor man, and he's got his shabby clothing, so it could be rags or it could be a cheap suit. Um, but you know, this guy, this guy is not nearly like the rich person. So what happens um, when, when two men like this enter into the synagogue? Um, so if you look, or if, if you look upon, maybe pay attention uh, to the one who is wearing the, 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 the bright clothing, the, uh, the, the, the stunning clothing, and you say, um, uh, you sit here, here you can sit well, so give them the best seat. And if then you say to the patoko, so it's a wonderful contrast here, and if you say, oh, you stand, or, so not even sit, but you stand over there, or if you sit, don't sit with me, but sit hupopodion, or sit at my feet. So to the rich man, of course, you gravitate and you give him the, the best seat in the house because he can do things for you and you admire the rich person. Um, and then to the poor person you treat with disdain, well, that is a, that is a problem in our Lord's way of, of thinking. Uh, for it says, uh, if you do that, do you not then judge among yourselves? And in fact, you're making distinctions among yourselves 
And in fact, you become judges now of evil thoughts. And I guess of dialogues, evil dialogues. Um, this is the same word used by Simeon when he said, um, he says of the child, the baby Jesus, he says, this man has come for the rising and falling of many, uh, many in Israel, and uh, the thoughts of many will be revealed. So you make distinctions among yourselves, and do you not then become judges of evil thoughts? And that's what it means to, to show partiality, to treat the, the poor man in such a shabby way, to treat the rich man as if he is so incredibly wonderful. So he says, Akusata, listen up, my brothers and be my beloved brothers. Um, did not our Lord choose the Patokos in the world uh, to be rich in the faith? And this is the pattern. Um, it is harder for um, a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, of course, that is followed up by the fact that with God all things are possible. And in the Gospel of Luke, we think of um, uh, we think of the the rich who uh, uh, of the, the rich who did in fact convert. And then in the book of, of Acts, we see many wealthy members who actually help Paul along along the way. So. Uh, it is possible, and in fact, it does happen. But in, for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven as adults, we must become like children. And if we are rich, we must consider ourselves to be, to be poor. That is, to um, we are beggars, all beggars before God. So, listen up, my beloved, for did not God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith? and inheritors. Now that sounds like um, the kind of language we might have in, in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, certainly, we, uh, the meek shall inherit the earth. So they, they are rich in faith, the poor, and they are inheritors of the kingdom, which kingdom, which, haste he promised uh, to those who loved him. So we've got to see things not from the way the world sees things, but from the way that God sees things. Um, and so he says in verse uh, 6, he says, but, but you have, there's temeo is the word for honor, and then the eight, that, that's the alpha primitive, pr primitive, so for you have dishonored the poor man. Now, in some ways, you know, when, when you dishonor the poor man, of course, you, you dishonor Christ himself, because Christ, from Philippians, though he was rich for our sake, became poor. So we do not want to, to never despise the one who is poor, never despise the one who is weak or the one who is lowly, for Christ associates himself with the poor and the weak and the lowly. Christ himself was not a wealthy man. Um, uh, so foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to, to lay his head. So he says, you have dishonored the poor man. It could be the poor man who is mistreated with the shabby clothes, who is nothing splendid to look upon, but also by dishonoring that poor man, you have dishonored the poor man Again, who was Christ, who, though rich, became poor for our sake. And then he says something kind of interesting. It's a little wry note here. He goes, now think about this. Uh, you're honoring these rich people, but these plusioi, they like plutoc plutocracy, the rule of the rich, they, uh, they have over you kata dunastusin, which is they, they overpower you, they have, they, 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 they have power over you, which they exercise over you, and they even, Elko, they drag you into the courts. Now you can imagine, again, a, a poor fellow who was brought to pay a fine, 
And uh, you can imagine the rich man has a whole team of lawyers. And this was at a time when the poor were very vulnerable, and of course they always are. And the rich lorded over the poor. And yet still we, we give the rich such, such honor, and we, we need to uh, watch ourselves. I know um, certainly as pastors that's our task. So it's so easy to, it's like high school, you gravitate towards the, the wealthier and the better looking, and as pastors and as people, we have to do exactly the opposite. That we look for the outsider, we look for the lost sheep, we look for the one who uh, no one is paying attention to. Uh, we, we pay attention first to the poor and then to the rich. Um, so don't, uh, <laughs> and again, if, you, if you've been involved with politics at all, you know that's always the way it is, that people are always using one another in order to climb up to climb up the ladder. So uh, a powerful person comes in, a senator comes in, a congressman comes in, and everybody rushes to meet that person, or a celebrity comes in, and how exciting it is. And, and then the other person comes in, and you know nobody pays any attention to them at all. Well, God doesn't look at life like that. And again, who was, who was Mary among the women of Israel? And uh, there were many princesses of the time. She wasn't in the court, the emperor's court. And yet she is the one who is honored. Uh, so also we think of the birth story of the poor lowly shepherds. That, uh, the, that uh, Caesar Augustus was sitting on his throne. He was ruling all the empire. And yet our Lord did not appear to uh, him. The angels did not come and sing to them. But they came to poor lowly shepherds who were out watching their flocks by night. And so it is with our Lord today. Um, and, and this is the way it also is with the gospel, that uh, the gospel often fares uh, poorly in lands that are rich because people are full and they have no need for anything else. They have no need for God. And yet so often the hungry are those also who hunger for the gospel uh, because they realize there must be more to this life. Well, why are you being so uh, obsequious? Why are you offering such honors to the rich when they... They have this power over you, and they drag you into courts and cause you such uh, misery. And uh, these are aren't they who aren't these those who, who blaspheme the name which has been placed upon you? So they look down on you and they say, uh, "Oh, you Christians!" I mean, you can almost hear the it's dripping uh, with sarcasm because they have no need for for God. Well. Um, so we continue with, with verse, verse 8, and he says, If indeed you, and this is a great line, if you fill, complete, or fulfill the, the royal, I love this, the law, the basilicon, the royal law according to the scriptures, which is the, it's, it's the summary of the law when it comes to our neighbor, neighbor. You will love your neighbor. You shall agape your neighbor as yourself. And if you do that, well, then kalos, you do, you do well. But if on the other hand, if on the other hand you show partiality, if you lift up your face and you look at the face and you say, that's the one I want. If you show partiality, well, then you work, you work, ergot zesta, you work a sin. Or we would say you commit a sin. And um, partiality is a sin. And because of that, you are convicted uh, by the law, and you are parabatai, as transgressors. So, uh, whoever um, keeps, whoever would keep the whole law, but if he falls in one, in just one of the commandments, he becomes, now this is also Enoxos, this is a word that uh, we find in the Sermon on the Mount. And um, I, I think that this is James, who is the, the brother of our Lord, and he speaks like our Lord does in that opening uh, 
in that opening sermon of, on the Sermon on the Mount. So whoever keeps the whole law, and of course, would that we could, um, and he's using this as an example because nobody does, but imagine if a person kept the whole law, but just fell in one. Well, the law is something, it's, uh, it's not forgiving. <laughs> the law is not forgiving. Because if you break simply one commandment, of course, then you are liable. You become liable for all of them. So whichever commandment you break, and here showing partiality, is to break the commandment, which is the summary of the second part of the second table of the law, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. This is not love uh, for for neighbor. Now. Okay, I think I went too far here. Excuse my computer deficiency as I get back to, there we go. So this is the problem, isn't it? Because we skip verses 11, 12, and 13, in which James gives examples of what it might mean to break one commandment and then to be, to be liable uh, for all of uh, breaking them all. But now we get this kind of question, which, I mean, as Lutherans, it's, uh, it's a question we have to ask ourselves because we know we are saved by faith, by grace, apart from works. But now here's the other side of the coin, less we rely on that, and then we think that works are nothing, and then we prove that our faith actually is nothing as well. So he asks, what is the Ophelos? What's, what's the good? What's the benefit, my brothers? If you say, if someone says that he has faith, oh, I have faith, but has no works. Well, we know what kind of a faith that is. That's a dead faith. It's a faith that's not actually... It's a poser. It's a pretend faith. Um, do you think then if I say that I have faith, but then I have no works, is that faith able to save him? Well, we know what that answer is because, again, such a faith is really no faith at all. Now, let's see. Here we go again. See if I can find it. So, if uh, Adelphos or an Adelphe, so if a brother or sister is gumnoi or has gum, is, is in the state of being, is naked, or it might be poorly clothed, but here it does say, if one is naked um, and is without even ephemeral, that is, uh, even without any kind of uh, food to eat, um, or lepo, if they, if they lack even the daily, the, this is, it's a great word, ephemeral, like it's passing. If they lack the daily food, and if someone among you says, oh, go in peace, and I love this, um, be warm and be fed. So this is, um, it reminds me like there's a, there's a fr phrase that's used, prayers ascend, and I'm kind of wondering, well, are you actually praying for that person? And then are you actually helping that person if that person needs help? So I see this person, and they're hungry, they need clothing, and you say, oh, yes, go in peace and uh, be warm and be well-fed. Um, but you, what have you done for, for that person? Have you done anything at all? With, if you don't do anything without, but you do not dote, if you not give to them, the things that are necessary for the body, well then what good have you done? You haven't done anything. So this is a challenge to us. 
um, not to rest on our laurels or to rest on our pretend faith, but to put our faith into action. And faith not put into action will, in fact, die, and we can delude ourselves. Uh, thus also, in verse 17, thus also is the faith. And um, so, so we know that faith without by itself, so that faith, if it does not have works, is necra, is dead, according to itself. So faith without works, we know, is absolutely dead, and it's just pretend. But in verse 18, but someone may say, you have faith, or you say you have faith, and I have works. Well, show to me your faith apart from works, and I'll show, I will deck so, from my works, my faith. And um, so really put your money where your mouth is. If you believe these things, then act in that way. If you believe that life is sacred, stand up for life. If you believe that the poor need help, if you believe that the gospel uh, needs to be preached, then be generous. And if you're not, if you're not giving generously to your church, then yeah, you should question yourself, and I will question myself, whether we actually believe this gospel. If we believed that the gospel was this powerful, powerful message which can save people, then in fact we would give generously. If we believe the gospel were powerful and it could help people, then we would speak the gospel, it would be on our lips. If we believe that God cared for the poor, yes, then we would care for the poor. And that's the, the prophetic message of James, and it's always an appropriate message for us to hear. It's a jolting message, but it's a refreshing message as well, that as Christians, we need to get in the game. And as we do, of course, we'll find even greater joy. And this is the challenge offered to us by our Lord's brother, James. So thank you for spending this time, and I pray you have a blessed Sunday.